Now, the rest of the story. Horatio Nelson, Lord Nelson, naval hero, Great Britain's greatest admiral, defeated the combined French and Spanish fleets at Trafalgar. Yes, of course you knew that. But did you know this? Lord Nelson, that daring warrior of the sea throughout most of his life, was a complete physical wreck. That's right. Oh, no, no, I don't mean a hypochondriac. He was just sick all the time. Frail, illness-prone as a child. He was therefore beleaguered by many and various maladies until his premature death at the age of 47. So physical susceptibility was Lord Nelson's most formidable adversary. And one susceptibility in particular, one that you would never guess. As a young man, he contracted malaria, suffered recurrences of the disease from then on, and then in April of 1780, he caught typhoid fever, and it was complicated by yet another malady, peripheral neuritis. The latter became chronic, impairing the use of his left arm and leg, and by 1786, his health had so deteriorated that he was thought by some doctors to have contracted tuberculosis. Well, it was not TB, but it was just about everything else. And then in July of 1794, he hit his head. The result was a detached retina, which cost him his right eye and precipitated progressive sympathetic blindness in his left eye. And, as though that weren't enough early in 1796, he was beginning to feel the effects of arteriosclerosis, hardening of the arteries. Not yet 38. He had begun to show signs of premature senility. 1797 brought an incipient ventral hernia and the amputation of his right arm. In the following year came a severe concussion which gave him headaches for weeks after. And he was just getting over them when a debilitating attack of influenza laid him low. Now remember, Lord Nelson was at sea all the while all of this was going on. And did I tell you about his dyspepsia? and his gout, and his angina so acute that by mid-1804, his physicians thought he had rheumatic fever. Today, my, today, we envision Lord Nelson as such a vigorous chap, partly because in battle he was so aggressive, so daring. Of course, he was killed at Trafalgar, shot in the back, but he lived just long enough to learn of his victory there. So in the end, it was not a disease which claimed him even though he was ill most all his life. And there was one illness in particular, one malady which certainly must have magnified the effects of all of the others. You see, Lord Nelson, Great Britain's greatest admiral, had been at sea since boyhood and continually struggled with something or other, malaria, typhoid, neuritis, hernias, concussions, dyspepsia, gout, and all the while he remained extremely susceptible to what seemed to him the most debilitating disorder of them all. Mal de mer, they called it. The ultimately ironic affliction of England's most outstanding naval hero. Chronic, insufferable, seasickness. And now you know the rest of the story. And now, the rest of the rest of the story. If you ever visit London, you'll undoubtedly see Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square. It was built to commemorate Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson's victory at the Battle of Trafalgar against the navies of France and Spain, the combined navies of the two countries. The column was constructed between 1840 and 1843 at a cost of about 47,000 pounds. Now, converting that to the American dollar and adjusting for inflation, that would come out to be about six and a half million dollars in today's money. Wow. The four bronze relief panels which decorate the four sides of the column's base are 18 feet tall and 18 feet wide. They were cast in bronze from captured French guns from the Battle of Trafalgar. From the bottom of the pedestal to the top of the statue of Nelson is 169 feet 3 inches. It's certainly an impressive sight to see, but most people who walk around it know little about the man the statue was put there to honor. 
When I was there, all I knew about it was that it was sitting in a place called Trafalgar Square because Lord Nelson died at the Battle of Trafalgar. So how can a sea captain become a sea captain if he struggles with seasickness? It seems impossible. Did Horatio Nelson, Vice Admiral of the British Navy, really suffer from seasickness? Well, in 1804, the Earl of Camden wrote to Nelson about his, the Earl's, nephew who had abandoned a naval career due to seasickness. Nelson responded in a letter in which he acknowledged his own struggles with the condition ever since joining the Navy at the age of 12. From his flagship HMS Victory, Nelson responded, I am ill every time it blows hard and nothing but my enthusiastic love for my profession keeps me one hour at sea. In 1776, Nelson was suffering from malaria and after about a vomiting, wrote that seasickness put him confoundedly out of humor. In 1793, while in command of the HMS Agamemnon, Nelson and his stepson were both recorded as being seasick in a strong gale off the southern English coast. Now, to understand Lord Nelson a little better, we have to go back to the beginning. Horatio Nelson was born in September 1758 in Burnham Thorpe, England. Burnham Thorpe is on the North Sea. His father was Reverend Edmund Nelson, and his mother was Catherine Suckling. Now, Catherine's brother was Maurice Suckling. He had a major impact on Horatio's life. Let me explain. On New Year's Day, 1771, 12-year-old Horatio joined the crew of a ship as an ordinary seaman. He was the lowest rank on board, but his uncle Maurice Suckling was captain of the ship. Shortly after joining the crew, Captain Suckling appointed Horatio as midshipman, the lowest-ranking officer on the ship. With this quick promotion, Horatio began officer training. Now, can you imagine being an adult on that ship, having to answer or take orders from an inexperienced 12-year-old? Mm -mm. But then, in late July 1771, Captain Suckling was transferred to another ship, the HMS Triumph, and Horatio was transferred to the merchant ship Mary Ann in order to get his sea legs to gain experience. Horatio crossed the Atlantic Ocean twice and returned to England a year later. He was then ordered to serve on the HMS Triumph, the ship captained by his Uncle Maurice. Thirteen-year-old Horatio heard about a planned expedition to survey a passage in the Arctic. Horatio wanted to prove himself. Well, Uncle Maurice pulled some strings and Horatio was transferred to the HMS Carcass for the expedition. In the summer of 1773, the carcass set sail for the Arctic with 14-year-old Horatio on board. They got within 10 degrees latitude from the North Pole, but were forced back by the ice. The carcass returned to England in September of the same year. Back in England, Horatio, now 15 years old, returned to his uncle's ship, the Triumph. Uncle Maurice then arranged for Horatio to serve aboard the HMS Seahorse. In February 1775, the Seahorse was carrying a large cargo of the East India Company's money, gold and silver, to Bombay when it was attacked by two ships. But after a brief exchange of fire, the two ships sailed away as quickly as they could. That was Horatio Nelson's first combat experience. In March 1776, 17-year-old Horatio contracted malaria and was seriously ill. He was ordered to return to England aboard another ship on a trip that took six months. By the time he arrived, he was well enough to return to service. Around his 18th birthday, Uncle Maurice, who was now Comptroller of the Navy, appointed Horatio acting lieutenant aboard the HMS Worcester. But before becoming lieutenant, Horatio had to pass a test. The examination board consisted of Captains John Campbell, Abraham North, and, well, you might have guessed it, good old Uncle Maurice. Horatio passed the exam. Horatio, now a full lieutenant, served aboard the HMS Lowestoff. 
During the American Revolution, the Lowstaff, with Lieutenant Nelson aboard, took several ships, including one ship they renamed Little Lucy. Horatio requested and was granted command of Little Lucy. It was his first time commanding a ship. Horatio impressed his superiors with his abilities. When the French entered the American Revolution on our side, the British fleet needed more captains. By the end of 1778, the British had captured many ships and Horatio received an estimated 400 pounds in prize money. Adjusted for inflation, that would be about $85,000 in today's money. Wow! In addition, Horatio became master and commander of the HMS Badger. He was just 20 years old. Now, what were you doing when you were 20 years old? I certainly wasn't as productive as being a master and commander of a ship, I can tell you that. Now, let's fast forward to the morning of October 21st, 1805. 47-year-old Lord Horatio Nelson had been a seaman for 35 years, was blind in one eye, missing a right arm, and had many other ailments. Again, the British fleet was up against the combined French and Spanish navies. Nelson was acting as vice admiral aboard the HMS Victory, that same ship where he wrote the letter about his seasickness. As the fleets converged, Victory's captain, Thomas Hardy, suggested that Lord Nelson remove the decorations on his coat so that he would not be so easily identifiable by enemy sharpshooters. Lord Nelson refused. He said there was not enough time. The HMS Victory led the British fleet into battle fought between 60 ships. An enemy cannonball struck and cut Lord Nelson's secretary nearly in two. The secretary's clerk, who took his position, was killed moments later. Victory's wheel was shot away by another cannonball. The battle continued for hours. At 1.15 p.m., Captain Hardy saw that Lord Nelson was kneeling on the deck, supporting himself with his hand before he collapsed onto his side. He had been shot by a sharpshooter. As men were carrying him below deck, he made them pause while he explained how to steer the ship without its wheel. As they carried him from the deck, Lord Nelson covered his face with his own handkerchief to avoid causing alarm. Lord Horatio Nelson died at 4.30 p.m., three hours after he'd been shot. But he lived long enough to learn that the British fleet had won the battle. Now, if we were to tally this battle like a baseball game, the British lost 458 sailors. France and Spain lost nearly 10 times that amount. The British captured 21 ships and completely destroyed another. They took nearly 8,000 French and Spanish soldiers prisoner. Lord Nelson is seen as the hero of Trafalgar. He's one of Britain's most heroic figures. There are numerous monuments honoring him, the most famous being Nelson's Column at Trafalgar Square. If you get a chance to visit London, be sure to visit Nelson's Column. Now you'll know why it's there. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And now you know the rest of the rest of the story.